Hallelujah. Man, I'm telling you, it's good to be in the house of God, isn't it? Amen. And so we want to welcome all of you that are watching uh, through our, any one of our multimedia devices. I see we have Miss Copeland from Florida. Howdy. Uh, some of the other ones, let me see. I only get some of you, so if I miss you, I'm sorry. But let me just, if you're watching through any one of our multimedia devices, now or after the fact, just welcome. Thanks for taking time out of your schedule to be part of what we're doing. Pastor Sandy is not with us today, as you've noticed. Pastor Mark, she, he did a pretty good job by himself. And so, um, <laughs> amen. <laughs> uh, she's on her way to Norfolk, Virginia to spend time with the family, so just keep her lifted up in prayer as well. So let's open with a word of prayer, and then we're going to get right into the Word of God this morning. And if I could have my microphone up just a little bit, I'd appreciate it. Father, in the name of Jesus, we just come before you right now, and we thank you for the Holy Spirit, man, the great Holy Spirit, who is our teacher, our guide, our comforter. And Holy Spirit, we ask you this morning to help me, teach through me, guide, and just unveil and reveal the holy written word of God. Bring revelation as we in, in, in endeavor to um, move forward and proclaim the word of God this morning. And we're just so grateful, Father, for your word because it is life and health and healing to all of our flesh. And so we thank you for that now in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, if I could have the lights turn to, um, there we go, yay. I was starting to look green. <coughs> Good morning. So, over the last two lessons, we're, we're talking about God encounters, how we can have that God encounter that we, we've read about now in Acts chapter 1 in our own living room. And what we found within this study so far is that there was a place that was so unique in the New Testament. It was a living room. It was somebody's living room that is mentioned 240 times in just the New Testament. We found out last week whose living room that was. That was Mary's. And so in the year of 70 AD, um, we're looking at this living room and it's written in Scripture as the upper room. And, and the upper room in Jerusalem, or Mary's living room, was destroyed by Rome's invasion in 70 A.D. It was then reconstructed by believers a few decades later during the reign of the Emperor Heridian, and it was then put back in use. In around 614 A.D., it was demolished again when the Persians invaded and began occupying Jerusalem. And then hundreds of years later, in the 12th century, again, this holy site, the upper room, um, was rebuilt and enhanced by the Crusaders at that point in time. And then what we found is that the last modifications to this particular room, or, uh, which is called the upper room, took place in the 14th century. And so since the 14th century, it has remained architecturally untouched. That's almost 800 years. And so one of the things that historians do agree on is that it is the authentic place where a plethora of biblical events took place, including, but not limited to, the unprecedented outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. And so what we're going to be looking at this morning within our study is when we fully surrender our home and our life to Jesus, we too can experience the power of Pentecost in our own living room, in our marriage, in our children, and our entire family will, will and can be filled with the mighty presence of the Holy Spirit. We're living in dark times and dark days, and our home has to be our sanctuary of life and light. And after Jesus ascended into heaven, the Bible says that they returned. Who? The disciples returned in Acts uh, chapter 1 unto Jerusalem from Mount Olivet, or the mountain called Olivet, which is from Jerusalem about a Sabbath day's journey. And the Bible says that when they were come in, they went up into the upper room, where they abode Peter, James, John, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James, 
the son of Elphi, well, son of Elphi, <laughs> and Simon the zealot, and Judas the brother of James. So remember Jesus had instructed his disciples not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise, gift of the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 1, verses 4 and 5. So in obedience, they returned to the city and made their way into the upper room. It was a room they were familiar with. It was a home they were familiar with. And they spent countless hours and days in this particular room and in this home with Jesus. And this was a room in Mary's house who was a wealthy widow uh, who lived near the, the Temple Mount in the central district of Jerusalem. And so, as we found in our study, Mary was the mother of John Mark, who later became Peter's secretary and wrote the Gospel of Mark. So, she was also the sister of Barnabas, whose name means what? Son of encouragement. And Barnabas was Paul's traveling companion in his first missionary journey. So we see all these people, how uniquely knitted together they are. Some are by blood and some spiritually. And so the, word up, the words upper room, again in, here in Acts chapter 1 and verse 13, in the Greek is huperoan, and it describes the highest part of the house. It was the upper rooms or the upper story of a house. And it was usually, again, the largest space in an ancient home. And in this case, the upper room was the upper chamber in Mary's home located on the second or third floor. Now, rooms like this were commonplace in the first century, and it served as many of the first churches. And so home churches were very popular. They didn't go to the, the, the building down on 5th. They gathered in people's homes. And God invaded these homes. And lives were changed in these homes. And hearts were touched in these homes. And so this was where the disciples gathered, was in the upper room as they waited in Jerusalem for the fulfillment of the promise that Jesus told them about. And it says in Acts chapter 1 and verse 14 then that they all continued with one accord and in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary the mother of Jesus and with his brethren. Now, we saw that the word here all in our previous study is the Greek word pantes, which means all of them. And as we pointed out last week, it was important to note that included in this particular a uh, segment of people were all the women. Mary, the mother of Jesus, was there with other women. In that particular society, it was, it was the women were always separated. They were always second class. Many t up until the resurrection, I, if I remember my history, uh, women weren't even allowed in the temples. They weren't even allowed to worship. Hallelujah! Thank God those times have changed. And so we so. The, the word all here, again, is the word pantes, and it means all-encompassing, indicates no one was excluded. So the Bible also tells us that there are approximately 120 people assembled who were personally involved with what was happening in that particular time frame. Now, as we look, these all continued with one accord. As we look at the next word, continued, it is also significant because it is the Greek word uh, proskaterios, and it means to preserve consistently, to per persevere or preserve consistently. It, it pictures it uh, to persevere consistently, not preserve, preserve, per persevere. Can't even read my own writing. You ever have that problem? I'm reading Greek, and I don't know what I'm writing. So it, it, it pictures intense focus, hard work, constant diligence that never lets up. Hallelujah. Intense focus, hard work, constant diligence, effort that never lets up. And the use of this word depicts that disciples were fixed in a forward uh, position, pressing in to receive what Jesus said was coming. They just weren't sitting there waiting for God to do something for them. They were busy pressing in. What were they pressing in? They're pressing into the things of God, waiting for the promise to be fulfilled. Th this was their sole purpose. They were, they were so focused that they were nearly addicted to seeing it happen. 
Hallelujah. Have you ever been so focused? Have you? I mean, I watch my kids sometimes on their, on their games, man, and we talk about addiction. They're just, uh, uh, this is what the, the disciples were doing. They were, they were pressing in. They were constantly, they were, they were putting effort into receiving what God had promised them. So, additionally, the scripture says the disciples were in one accord. In one accord, which is the Greek word, Humothomadon, and it is a compound word of humos, and which points to a moment in time when something happens at one time or simultaneously. And the word thomos, which pictures passion. Hallelujah. It's a picture of passion. And when these words are joined, the new word humothomadon pictures those who are stirred up, those who are excited, and are at one moment caught up in an eruption of passion. Oh, man, I'll tell you what, it's time that we get passionate about the things of God. We've, sometimes we've just come, become so accustomed to God that we forget. You know, I, I'm going to, uh, sometimes we live with our spouses for so long that we become accustomed to them, right? But I tell you, there's moments when my wife just walks in the room, she just lights up my life. I'm passionate because I'm still so much in love with her that, man, when she just comes into the room, I just, I just gravitate to her. I want to be with her. I want to be around her. Hallelujah. And that's, what, that's when we come into God's presence passionately. We gravitate to the things of God. We want to be around him instead of, oh, we're going to go to church. Oh, huh, well. And so they were caught up in a moment of eruption of passion. And they were experiencing what we would say a preview of what was coming. What were these faithful followers of Christ doing? What were these disciples doing? The Bible says right here that they continued in prayer. They continued in prayer, which is the Greek word prosuke or prosuke, however you want to say it. It's this particular word describes a upfront, close intimate contact. Woo! They wanted to have an upfront, close, intimate contact with God. It denotes coming closer to express a, express a wish, a desire, a prayer, or a vow. So, it also then portrays an individual who desires to see his prayers answered so desperately that he's willing to surrender everything he owns in exchange for the answered prayer. Man, I tell you, we'd see, we'd see a lot of things change in our lives if we'd come to God with that attitude. Passion, amen? So prayer, prosuke, contains the idea of surrender. It, and essentially, the disciples were saying to God, we'll give you all that we are and all that we have if you will give us all of you. Isn't that interesting? We're going to give you everything that we are if you'll give us everything you are. Hallelujah, I'm going to lay my life, I'm going to surrender my life to you. And so something else that's important to note that is that the disciples were praying with the women. Notice that, with the women. Mary and the mother of Jesus and his brethren. The phrase with the women in Greek, I'm not even going to try to even pronounce it, means together with women or in partnership with women. I like that, in partnership. It gives the note of teamwork. We're in partners with the women. The women aren't separate. They're not second class. They're not, they are in, they stand alongside of us. They are active partners with us. And I tell you, some of the greatest prayer warriors and partners I've ever met were women, man. I tell you. And, and when we despise women, we despise God. When we make women second class, we say, God, you made a mistake when you, and that's not truth. Because women stand alongside of man. When God created woman, he took the rib out of man. He took a part of man. He didn't take the foot or the heel, but he took a side of man. To me, that denotes that, that women are to stand alongside of men. And, you know, I think it's even more interesting in the business world, women are leading. And then we come into the church and they're not allowed to do much of nothing. Hallelujah. God's not, he, he, man, he doesn't, he don't hang in that category. He created women to be equal to men. Oh, oh, boy. We're in partnership with them. 
Hallelujah. Oh, I know. Send me those emails right after service and I won't read them. <laughs> so I truly believe if my wife is not a second class citizen in my home, why would I make her a second class citizen in the church? She helps make decisions in the home. Why wouldn't those that God has called? And, you know, if you really study the, I mean, if you really study Old and New Covenant, there were prophetesses in the Old Testament. There were prophetesses in the New Testament. But all of a sudden, when the church was birthed, we can't have no women in the ministry. I don't see that. Well, we're going to move forward because I'm digging myself deeper today. Amen? So, uh, then... We see that Mary and the mother of Jesus and his brethren were praying. So again, when we see this particular passage of Scripture, this is truly a miracle of God because normally women, again, were not allowed to participate in any spiritual gatherings at that time. However, when God began building the church, his church, he chose women, signifying that in his eyes, women are just as important as men. Amen. And... One woman specifically mentioned in the scripture here who was in the upper room was Mary, the mother of Jesus. Hallelujah. Jesus' mother was participating on this particular day. And the Bible then adds this phrase, and with his brethren. Which in the Greek literally means together with his multiple natural brothers. So it wasn't talking about his disciples. It was talking about his blood. His family was there. So what this shows is that the disciples were praying with Mary, the mother of Jesus, as well as Jesus' biological brothers. And at that point in time, Jesus' natural brothers were in partnership with what he was doing. They didn't always, I mean, when he was on the earth, they didn't always agree with what he did. Hallelujah. And I, I'm, I wonder, if you grew up with the Son of God, could you accept that he was the Son of God before he was buried and then rose from the dead? Oh, there's Jesus again, thinking he's God. I mean, how many people do you know? Well, never mind. Hallelujah. At, at, so at, at this point, Jesus' natural brothers were in partnership with what he was doing. See, they, didn't, they, they no longer looked at him as mentally unstable. Hallelujah. I mean, even James, who had been Jesus' ad, adversary during much of his earthly ministry, was now living in full support of his eldest brother. So... If Mary, the mother of Jesus, and the natural-born brothers of Jesus were present in the upper room on the day of Pentecost, it means they too were baptized with the Holy Spirit and they spoke with tongues. Hallelujah. Mary, the mother of Jesus, had to be born again to be able to receive the complete manifestation of the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. The same with his brothers. They fully embraced the Pentecostal experience and flowed, I believe, in the gifts of the Spirit as well. And so Acts chapter 2 documents one of the most important and powerful moments in the history of the world. And the Bible says in Acts chapter 2 and verse 1, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And so Pentecost here means the 50th day after Passover. It is the 50th day after Passover, and Pentecost was the second of the three great, what we would call Jewish feasts or festivals. <laughs> so Pentecost is just not the name of a modern-day denomination, as some would think, or a certain sect of Christians. It actually is a Jewish feast day. And it, it, is, an, it is a word marking the 50th day after Passover, which was the final day of the Festival of Weeks. And on that day, the Bible says that 120 were gathered in the upper room, and they were all with one accord and in one place. The word all here, again, is the Greek word pantes, which indicates all of them, meaning no one is excluded. And the phrase one accord, again, means together or in one place. And one place, uh, the Greek word um, 
basically means to be gathered together in one spot. So it's telling us that they were all in one place, one accord or one spot. And this is something truly powerful uh, about God's people because when we come together in one place and praying together in unity, power is made available. And so the Bible goes on to say, well, not only is power, but we become unified with one purpose. And the Bible goes on to say in Acts chapter 2, verse 2, And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the house where they were sitting. And so um, notice the phrase again, suddenly there came, which is the Greek word, um, never mind, <laughs> hallelujah, in, in genitu. Afno, in genitu afno, you see? Uh, I almost got it, almost, but almost only counts in hand grenades and horseshoes, so we're all, well, never mind. So when these words come together as a phrase, it means something happened that took completely off guard and by surprise. Something happened that took them completely off guard and caught them by surprise. These men and women of God had been praying intensely for approximately what we can gather from historical accounts, about 10 days to receive this gift called the Holy Spirit. And ironically, when the Spirit finally came, they were completely caught off guard because what occurred was what they did not expect. They didn't expect what occurred. Hallelujah. When God shows up, I will tell you, you're going to get caught off guard because it's not going to be what you expect. Hallelujah. He's going to do exceedingly far abundantly above all that you can ever ask, dare, or think. And the Bible says, in, in, continuing in Acts chapter 10, uh, 10, 2 verse 2, and there came a sound. Hallelujah. There came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty when and so when we look at that word sound in the Greek it's it's echoes which is the same word used to describe the violent roaring and overwhelming sound of the sea in the middle of a huge storm now I don't know I've never been out to sea in the middle of a huge storm but I I mean just the other day I heard the wind blowing it at around 60 miles an hour around my house and man it was loud it was loud and so the words from heaven, then, is the Greek word. Which, it's a Greek word which means right out of heaven or directly out of heaven. So when that, there came a sound from heaven, it, came, it was so loud, it was as loud as a violent, roaring, and overwhelming sound of the sea in the middle of the storm, and it came right from heaven. And the violent, roaring sound, it came directly out of heaven and pierced the atmosphere of the upper room. And what was happening was heaven was invading Mary's living room, the upper room. Heaven was invaded. How would you like to have heaven invade your living room in that manner? The sound from heaven was as a rushing mighty wind. In the Greek, the words as of means just as like or exactly like. So the sound from heaven was exactly like a rushing mighty wind. The word rushing in Greek means being carried or being born. So the word mighty describes, and then the word mighty describes something forceful, mighty, or violent. When we look at the word wind, it's the Greek word pan panone, and it describes a real blast or a gust of wind. Throughout Scripture, what we find Wind was often a symbol of God's powerful presence. So let's just take a moment. I know I've just like rushed through all these Greek words, but that's okay. It's all Greek. So if we'll just take a moment to imagine what was taking place here. Picture with me, if you will, 120 or so devoted believers were passionately united in prayer in a very large second or third story room of Mary's home in the center of Jerusalem, her living room. And they had been pressing in, praying for several days, when all of a sudden, God moved. And the spirit world invaded the natural world with a sound so forceful and fierce, it must have been deafening. Because we just read how loud it was in, in the Greek. Forceful, mighty, violent. And at that moment, the rushing mighty wind filled the house. 
Now, in the Greek, the word filled means to make full, to fill completely, or to fill to the point of satisfaction. And again, when we see the word all here is not pantes, it's the Greek holos, and it denotes the whole house, meaning that no part of this house was untouched. None. Every nook and every cranny of every room of the house was filled with the powerful manifestation of God's Spirit. Man, that sounds like church to me. And what happened when this happened? Well, we go to Acts chapter 2 and verse 3, and we see that there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. And it sat upon each of them. The word appeared in this verse is, is a form of the Greek word horea, and it means to see, to delightfully view, or to fully view. The use of this word tells us here that those that were in attendance could physically see something taking place before their very eyes, and they were delighted by it. Delighted. Hallelujah. They could see this. This wasn't a manifestation that was God wrote down and nobody saw it, but it appeared unto them as of cloven tongues, and they could see it, and they were delighted by it. And the Bible states that the, that the cloven tongues, like as a fire, is what appeared in plain sight. The word cloven means divided. And the word tongues is the Greek word glossolalia, and it indicates there were flame-like appearances of fire. Woo! Hallelujah! Flame-like appearances of fire! I remember a story about a church uh, in Fort Worth, um, Dr. Bob Nichols, Calvary Cathedral. And this was happening in the 90s, and uh, I guess a young evangelist was there. I've heard the story directly from him and um, some other people that were present, but th there, there was a young evangelist there by the name of Rodney Howard Brown, and they were having revival. And they had a, I guess they had a prayer tower, and, and I don't know all, I can't relate all the details, but as they were having this revival, there was fire, I guess, coming out of the steeple of the church. Fire department was called. But you know, it wasn't a fire of naturally. It was a Holy Ghost fire. Hallelujah. The building was not on fire, but people could see flames. This states here that they could see flames of fire. The Greek word fire is, is, is pure and is a symbol. It, it, it has been a symbol of the presence of God since he cut covenant with Abraham in Genesis chapter 15, verse 17. And one of the things that we know about fire in Scripture is it purifies it brings illumination, provides warmth and life, and it produces energy and power. So suddenly, out of nowhere, the fire of God materialized in an atmosphere, in the atmosphere of the room, and it began to divide in what appeared to be tongue-like flames that sat upon each of them. <laughs> when we look at the word sat in the Greek, it's, and it means to figuratively to hover, to sit down, or to settle on each of them. They were all filled. All. Acts chapter 2 and verse 4 it goes on to say, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Again, the Greek word all here is the Greek word pantes, and it is all-inclusive word indicating all of them. You see, there's an argument that God chooses whom he would to be baptized in the Holy Ghost. Some get it, some don't, because it's God's will. If it was God's will, it would have shown here that only some of them got it. But it says that all of them, no one was excluded from being filled. Again, the word filled is a form of the Greek word Plauro, meaning to make full or to fill completely. When the disciples were filled, the Bible says they began to speak, which, is the, which in the Greek carries the idea of initiative. 
So often we think that when we get baptized with the Holy Spirit and we're supposed to begin to speak with other tongues, we stand here. And then wonder why nothing comes out because you're not showing initiative. You're working in conjunction with the Holy Spirit to speak through you. When the disciples were filled, they began to speak. And so the disciples were involved in their own initiative and participation and they commenced to speak and converse in other tongues. It puts it back on them. They were filled. But then, then they had to participate and then they commenced to speak. I don't know about you. I've been married 30, well, I can't remember, 32 years, I think this year. I don't know. Long time and wonderful time. You know, but I haven't got to the place yet when I'm sitting in my lazy boy recliner that I need something, I want something, I need to be fed. I don't care what it is, that I just think it and my wife hops up and goes and gets it. Have you? No, there has to be initiative. I have to speak, I have to use my voice. I have to make declarations of, that I have a need. And so often what we think is that we don't have to do that with God when we come to praying in the Holy Ghost or praying in other tongues, that all we're going to do is open our mouth. I, I mean, the other thing, have you ever noticed? I mean, I've tried it a few times. I've sat in that chair and went, my wife will look at me, what do you need, stupid? Hmm. No, I have to communicate. I have to advantageously engage with my brain. And so we work with the Holy Spirit. We have to be involved. And so the other thing that we, that we see here, uh, th so the disciples were involved in their own initiative. And then if you look up here, the word other, um, the Holy Ghost began to speak with other tongues. The Greek word here is heteros, which means an, another or a different kind as opposed to that one that is familiar or similar. When they spoke, what they spoke was not a language which, which they were familiar with. That's why it's other tongue. I remember a story. You see, we all think, we, uh, when, I was, when I was born again and received the baptism of the Holy Ghost, you know, they all said, oh, that's your heavenly language. You know, that's, your only, that's between you and God. Nobody can understand it. And, that's, and there's a lot of truth to that. However, the languages that, we're, that we receive when we speak in tongues, I don't believe are just a heavenly language, but they're languages of the earth that you're unfamiliar with. And I'll give an example. Many years ago, uh, I, heard, I heard a story of a missionary who was deep in, in, in the mountains of Mexico. And they were, they were doing missionary work, and the people where they were in, they were um, uneducated people. Not, they weren't dumb, they, were just, they didn't have education as far as what we would consider education. And so they spoke in their own dialect of the, excuse me, of the language. This particular older lady received Jesus and then was baptized in the Holy Ghost. And as she began to speak in the other tongue, the missionary said she was speaking the most perfect, beautiful English glorifying God. Now, she didn't understand a word she was saying, but it was still a known language. And so what this then is saying is that when they began to speak in another tongue or another language, it was a language they were unfamiliar with. And if you look into Acts chapter 2, and I'm, I'm not sure if I have it in my notes, but Acts chapter 2 is when, the, when they moved the party out into the, from the upper room into the neighborhood, it said that even though they were speaking in other tongues, the Persians and the Medes could understand what they were saying. So that also gives proof or denote that they were speaking in a known language of the earth. And... So, the Bible says that the, dis the disciples spoke as the Spirit gave them utterance. The word gave is the Greek word idios from the word didomai, which means to give or to impart or to transfer. And the word them in the Greek is autois, which means to, to them the Spirit gave or the Spirit imparted or transferred to them this divine ability this divine ability, and the emphasis then is again on them. 
And, and a careful study of the book of Acts reveals that every time that the Holy Spirit filled people, they spoke with tongues. <coughs> Excuse me. And this is a de definitive pattern that's revealed in Acts chapters 2, 8, 9, 10, and 19. And the Holy Spirit imparted or transferred to each recipient the, uh, the divine ability to speak in a different kind of tongue than what they were familiar with. Different kind of tongue than what they were familiar with. So the events that took place on the day of Pentecost described in Acts chapter 2 are not figurative. They are literal. What we know and what we've seen this morning is that the spirit world invaded the physical world and the power of the Holy Spirit violently shook the place and filled the the people and fill the people when we come back next week we're going to look at how jesus wants your living room but it's important to understand that what we're seeing within this study wasn't a church setting it was a person's home how god invaded a person's home how god used an individual's home so for his purpose and his glory. And the other thing is, it's important to note that that person opened their home. It was a place where Jesus was welcome. It was a place where his disciples were welcomed naturally. It was a place where the family of God was welcome. And because of that, that room, that place is written about in 240 scriptures, or a little more than that, in the New Testament. How important is your house for God? It's important. That's where God invades your life. It's not here at the church. This is a place where we come and gather corporately. But our homes are a sanctuary for the, 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 the living God. It is a place where the Spirit of God dwells and breathes and moves in because you dwell, you abode there, you live there. We shouldn't come to the church once a week to get filled up or twice a week to get the Word of God. We should be filled in our own living room. We should be having Pentecost daily in our own home. We should have those things and then come to the church on fire for the living God so that the flame of God is reproduced into those that don't even know Him. We're so busy trying to get built up in the church that we're going home and leaking out and not refilling. And it's time that we come to a place where our home is our place of God encounters. God wants to invade your home and he wants to move in your home and he wants to do the miraculous in your home and he wants his glory to abide in your, your home. All you have to do is open the door and he'll come in like a mighty rushing wind. But think about Think about the experience that these disciples had. God is in the experience. He wants you to experience him in a new and dynamic way. He wants to blow the doors off your house with his glory and his power. He wants to set some things in motion that when you walk through the door, it's like walking in the church. God's here. And it's a holy place. More and more, you know, I don't know about you. But more and more, God's just showing me areas in my own life that maybe he's not 100 percent. He's not saying, oh, you living in sin, you dirty thing. But he said, you know, that's just maybe something we could talk about. Maybe you putting aside. So it's not harmful, but it's not drawing you any closer to me either. I want to be so filled with the with the presence and the essence of God. And I'm nowhere near that because I'm human. But that God says, this one needs my salvation. This one needs my healing. And you know what? You walk up to them and their lives are changed and their hearts are touched because you've been in God's presence. Your home is, in, is a place where you encounter God daily. And when you encounter God, let me tell you something, you'll not be the same. We've become too common with God. We're not expecting the spectacular and the supernatural anymore because it's God. When God shows up, when the natural and the supernatural come together, there's a mighty explosive force for God. 
And it's time the church of God becomes the mighty, explosive force of God. Hallelujah. We're here not to receive everything God has. We're here to be a product of the kingdom of God. And God is a God of power. God is a God of love. God is a God who delivers. And he delivers us through his people. And we need the Holy Spirit. This morning, if you've never, ever been filled with the Holy Spirit and with the evidence. See, here's the key. When you are full of the Holy Spirit, it says there's evidence. And you've been filled with the Holy Spirit. You've never been filled with the Holy Spirit. This morning, I want to invite you to pray with Pastor Kim and I. And when we pray and we lay hands on you, I believe with my whole heart that you'll have the same experience that occurred in Acts chapter 2. And they were all filled. They were all filled. They were all filled. If there's anyone in this room that's never been filled with the Holy Spirit and would like that gift with the evidence of speaking other tongues, I just invite you right now to come up here. Right now. Hallelujah. Amen. So everybody in this house has been filled. Now, Pastor Kim, if you're watching through our multimedia devices, Pastor Kim is going to come up here and tell you exactly how you can be filled with the Holy Spirit right where you are sitting. Well, amen. You know... The Bible says whatsoever things, you know, whatever we ask for, basically, the Bible says that, you know, when it's in line with the Word of God, that, you know, the Father will give us. You know, if you think about your, your children, you know, when they come and ask you for things, um, you don't go out and, you know, if they, they, ask, they were to ask you for an apple, you know, you're not going to go out and you're not going to come back and give them a... Uh, an orange or, or give them a um, a cucumber or something you know you're gonna you try your best to in the natural give your children what they ask for so we are gonna ask we know it's God's will for you to be filled with the Holy Spirit and so we're gonna I'm gonna say a prayer and if you repeat it after me uh, you'll be filled with the the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in other tongues so, Father, in the name of Jesus. Father, in the name of Jesus. I ask you. I ask you. To baptize me. To baptize me. In the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. With the evidence. With the evidence. Of speaking in other tongues. And speaking in other tongues. I thank you that I receive that. I thank you that I receive that. And that I speak with other tongues. That I speak with other tongues. Amen. Amen. Now, I just invite you to join with us for just a moment at the congregation as we pray in other tongues to help facilitate your prayer language. Hallelujah. Father, we just come before you. It's to gongre e mamande, it's to stumbre u cantande, e mangangre, e purustu, custecante, e mangangre, e punducto, e mamangre, es de cipre, e ingro uno, es de stengre, e manini. It's you that is putting the initiative into speaking what you hear on the inside of you. You're working with the Holy Spirit. He's empowered you with a supernatural language, but you still have to use your voice and you still have to put the initiative in to doing that. Man, we'd love to hear from you if you prayed that prayer this morning and it changed your life. The most important decision we can ever make in life is not where we're going after church or, or you know, who we're going to marry. The most important decision in life is an eternal decision. And that decision is whether or not you accept Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. The Bible says that if we'll confess with our mouth that what we believe in our heart, that we would be saved. Where we spend eternity is a choice that God has given us or empowered us and only us to make. The Bible says that we're all born into this world into death, but through Jesus Christ, we can have life. And the way we do that is we accept Jesus as our personal Lord and Savior. And Pastor Kim is going to tell you exactly how we can do that together. Amen. The Bible says that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I'm going to pray a simple prayer where you call upon the Lord and you will be saved. Father, in the name of Jesus. 
Father, in the name of Jesus. I believe in my heart. I believe in my heart. And confess with my mouth. And confess with my mouth. That Jesus is Lord. That Jesus is Lord. All my sins are forgiven. All my sins are forgiven. And I'm a child of God. And I'm a child of God. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Now, if you prayed that prayer for the very first time, let me be the first to welcome you to the kingdom of God. And, and then the next thing I want to encourage you is to find yourself a good church because you're going to need to grow and to develop in the, in, the, in, in the things of the kingdom. And if you're here in San Antonio, man, we invite you to become a partner with us and, and join the revolution by, by coming and um, checking out our campus in 6995 Alamo Downs Parkway right here in the Alamo City of San Antonio. Where are we located? We're in the far west part of the city out by Colliani Harley-Davidson, uh, also uh, Ingram Park Mall. Uh, we're inside the loop uh, off of Calabra Road. Um, come check us out, man. We'd love to, to meet with you and, and have you uh, become part of the family here at His Grace Church. Uh, the other thing that we want to encourage you is if you prayed that prayer for the very first time on our website, uh, you go to www.hgc.church, click on resources, that'll take you to our MP4 page. And there's a series out there called The New Birth. And they're just about 10 five-minute videos on just a, a cliff note of what just happened to you to kind of give you an understanding, a little bit of knowledge of what occurred in, in, in your life with uh, being born again. Pastor Kim and I uh, are so thankful that for, for that you've made that decision to be part of the family of God. We pray for you, and we, we want the best for you. Man, um, Thursday nights, Amplify, we're returning at the heat every Thursday night. This week, this week it's going to be different because we're going to be teaching um, a basic, um, um, not Bible foundations, but it's just a new believers class, and we're going to be teaching like uh, little 10 minutes to 15 minute segments and we're going to be rotating through all of our associate ministers and so every Thursday night for about for the next few weeks we'll have three ministers up here with a with a cliff note section of the things that you need to know once you come into the family of God so amplify every Thursday night we're turning up the heat for, with practical teaching for everyday living we hear it we see it and then we live it together we live stream from the campus 7 to 8 p.m. and our campus is open as well. And then we want to remind you, Ignite every Tuesday night is our corporate prayer. Tuesday nights, virtually on Zoom, 7 to 7.30, 7.40. All that information is on our um, Facebook page. Facebook page. Uh, you, it's the easiest thing. You just go to Facebook, click on it. It'll open up Zoom, and then it logs you right in. And we pray for about 30 minutes for our nation. We pray for the services. And so... Um, Pastor Kim and I always are um, just appreciative of each and every one of you that help us and participate in taking the gospel of Jesus Christ out into a lost and dying world. So this morning, P Pastor Kim and I believe that God has something unique to say to you this week. And our hope is that you feel his love stronger today than ever before. Pastor Mark is going to come and close the service and Pastor Kim and I will be at the back to, to greet with you and check you out. Not check you out, talk with you. Jeez. God bless you. Hallelujah. Well, yeah. It, Go. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord causes his face to shine upon you. May direct your path, your steps be ordered of the Lord. And may the angels of God surround and protect you and all of your house and everywhere that you go. And we look forward to seeing you back here at His Grace Church coming up on uh, Thursday night for Amplify and next Sunday morning. We'll also be having intercessory prayer on Tuesday, right? Is it this, th this week? Tuesday at 7 o'clock from 7 to 7.30. On Zoom, check out our website at hgc.church, and you'll check, and it'll give you a direct connection to that, or go right to our way, our website on Facebook. All right, so Father God, we thank you for this service. Thank you for Pastor Mike and Pastor Kim. Lord, we bless all of the people who are 
members and partners online. Lord, there, may, there, may you bring, we believe or see that you will bring this back to their remembrance, the things that he taught today, that their hearts will be changed forever. In Jesus' name, amen.